Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's webcast entitled Finding Agencies in a Diverse and Digital World. Today's conversation is brought to you by Communications Match and powered by OnStream Media. To submit a question or comment at any time during the webinar, please click on the Ask a Question button on the bottom of your screen. Simply type your message into the box and click the Submit button. Alternatively, you could submit your question via Twitter using the hashtag agency search. All questions will be answered at the end of today's presentation. At this time, it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to today's moderator, Simon Erston Bach, the founder and CEO of Communications Match. Simon, the floor is yours. Thanks very much indeed. Um, well, I would like to um, just start by thanking everyone who has uh, joined us for this webinar today. Um, we know your time is valuable, so we appreciate taking an hour of your day um, to participate um, in this webinar, and uh, um, thank you. So, uh, quick intro. So, I, as, as I was introduced, my name is Simon Erskine Locke. I am the founder and CEO of Communications Match. We're a search platform designed to help companies find communications agencies and consultants that match their needs. Now, I've worked both on the agency and corporate side of the communications business before I became an entrepreneur. So, I'm delighted to moderate today's webinar, which brings together an exceptional panel with corporate, agency, research, and diversity expertise represented. I'd also like to thank ComPro and Fay Shapiro for partnering with us on this webinar. Now, we'll leave time for questions at the end, but don't hesitate to share any as we go along. And the goal is to make this as free-flowing as possible and provide some specific takeaways for participants in the process. I'll keep the introduction short since you've probably already had a chance to read everyone's bios, but it's important that uh, we know who's speaking. And first up, um, in terms of my introduction is Tony Chivas, who is Head of Business Development at ResearchScape. ResearchScape is a leading provider of communications-focused uh, research solutions, and earlier this year, they launched a fascinating report on agency satisfaction. Um, Tony, you there? I am. Thank you, Simon. A pleasure. So next up is Neil Foote. And Neil is president of the National Black Public Relations Society. He's a veteran journalist and media executive. And he also teaches digital and social media for journalists, uh, media management and business journalism at the University of North Texas's Frank W. and Sue Mayborn School of Journalism and runs Foot Communications. Uh, Neil, thanks for joining us. You're there, I assume, as well. Yes, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Next up is Robert Udowitz. Now, Robert is principal at RFP Associates, a leading agency search consultancy. Robert and his business partner, Steve Drake, founded RFP Associates in 2010 after observing the agency selection process from both sides of the aisle and recognizing the need to both streamline the search process and improve the methodology by which agencies are chosen and communications campaigns are executed. Uh, Robert, welcome. Thank you, Simon. I look forward to this discussion. And last, but definitely not least, is Jennifer Witter. Jennifer is the CEO and founder of the Borland Group, a 14-year-old public relations agency headquartered in New York City. Jennifer is a PR veteran who was named one of the country's top 10 black CEOs slash entrepreneurs by Madame Noir magazine. She's the author of The Little Book of Big PR, 100 Plus Quick Tips to Get Your Small Business Noticed. Jennifer is actually uh, dealing with a bit of an attack of laryngitis, so she doesn't always sound as good as she will sound today. You have that right. My voice comes in and out, but Simon, I'm so happy to have the opportunity to participate in this discussion. Well, terrific. So the focus of this webinar is on finding agencies in a digital and diverse world. Um, and I'm going to take a couple of minutes quickly to say why we focused on this and, and why is this relevant. So the companies, and remember I was both on the company hiring side of agency and also on the agency side of the business, the search process can be overwhelming and underwhelming at the same time. And if you include internal communications, SEO, and content marketing experts along with PR agencies, there are tens of thousands of firms uh, to choose from. That's the overwhelming bit. Now, despite this, it's very often a challenge to find 
firms or the people with the specific skill sets, industry expertise, or of an agency size that match a company's needs. Um, and sometimes it becomes underwhelming, that challenge, because it's hard to find the right firms. Now, we should add in, when it comes to finding and engaging diverse firms, let's say, and we'll talk more about this, the industry still has some way to go. Now, selecting the right agency or consultant, although simple in concept, is often a frustrating and time-consuming journey, often full of mismatches and missteps for both companies and agencies. And getting it right matters for both. So in this webinar, we're going to share insights and perspective on ways companies can improve the odds of finding not only the firms with the skill sets, expertise, and diversity they're looking for, but also the right fit. The ability to find and shortlist agencies, we have to recognize, is only half the story. And that's the business that communications matches in, helping companies find agencies. But the other half of the story is really we have to focus and consider the selection process. And we're going to talk about ways in which we can provide the greatest chance for establishing successful and even award-winning relationships in this call. Now, at the same time, we're going to explore why it is so important to include diverse agencies in the search process. So that's enough from me. Let's jump in. And I'm really going to ask the first question of uh, Robert Udowitz. Robert, you know, how can you provide some perspective on how you feel agency search works today? You know, what's working and what can be improved? Absolutely, Simon. Thank you. Well, given that um, RFP Associates focuses on helping clients find suitable agencies, I can only say that the best, most successful agency searches today are always conducted with a formalized process and a careful consideration of what the end result needs to be. Search, um, any search requires gathering a team that's going to work with the chosen agency, a timeline that's not rushed, and everyone is committed to a carefully selected and pre-vetted list of a small handful of candidate agencies and an understanding that can be committed to on paper of what the statement of work needs to be. Potential agencies, they should be considered based on expertise and experience and never simply the recommendation of others. Other factors certainly should include geography and target audience, but what does not work, Simon, is actually all the opposites of what I've just described. A rush process, non-transparency, not including a budget, unrealistic expectations, and in some cases, a general unfairness to all the competing agencies. Uh, Jennifer, can I um, ask you to provide a little bit of perspective? When you think about how the agency search process works, as an agency, what's your perspective? I think that from the agency agency perspective, that more and more companies are putting a more meaningful effort to pull from a deeper pool of candidates. And when I say a deeper pool, what I mean, one that is more broad-ranging in terms of race, um, sexuality, and ethnicity, because in today's world, it is a glorious mosaic. And with the amount of people that we have entering in the industry and the ones that are already there, it behooves the agency to have a staff that is reflective of the environment that we are in. And one of the things is, is that more and more companies are looking for diverse teams. So I totally agree with Robert that you have to have transparency and not to rush it. But I also feel that if you take additional time to go outside of the the, the the framework that has been used in the past, that the agency search will become much more enriched and fuller and will be reflected by the staff numbers. Another thing is that I've noticed with the search done today is that I've seen a lot of PR companies, myself included, have gone to social media 
and say, we're hiring now, you know, come to us. So they are going straight to the source. And by going on social media, which is the broadest, deepest pool out there, they're able to attract the individuals that they want. They may get a lot of uh, resumes that are they're putting to the left instead of the right, but it also allows them to pull from a deeper number of candidates, and that's the beauty of uh, social media today that when I started in the industry 30-plus years ago, we didn't have. You know, um, I'm going to sort of change, uh, just add a, then a, a bit of perspective is when we at Communications Match did um, some, some research actually working with ComPro. Um, earlier in the year, we, we produced the 2017 agency search report. One of the things that came up um, as a, a primary way in which uh, firms, were, the, the primary tool that firms both looked and, and identified agencies and also way agencies was found was word of mouth. Um, so on the slide in front of us now, I think we had 76% um, of respondents to the survey said asking peers as a starting point for the search was actually the way they, the, the primary way they would actually do search. Neil, I wonder if you can provide your perspective on, uh, given the context of you know, the way agency search is working today, given the importance of, of word of mouth, you know, is that a um, is going down that path something that's actually going to help companies find the agencies they're looking for, or do we need to think about this in a slightly different way? Yeah, I think we've got to uh, you know be that much more innovative about the approach to finding you know uh, and identifying more diverse firms in the search process. Uh, yeah, I love the the construct and and the, the the basic foundation that you know we need transparency and a clear process because that's that ultimately is what we want in any any search process or hiring process or recruitment process. Uh, but the the fact of the matter is is that um, the search process is only as good as potentially those who are doing the search, which means that. Sadly so, the lack of diversity throughout certain ranks of uh, our senior, certainly the C-suite at, at the agency level, is, is minimal. Uh, you have two exceptions on this call today with Jennifer and I kind of running our own, our own firms at that level, but when you get to the major agencies, that does not happen, and potentially what is getting lost in some of this search is the sense of, uh, and the comment that I too often hear, Simon is we can't find any diverse firms, we mm -hmm. can't find any diverse executives. Uh, yeah. That, to me, kind of goes to the point of in, if you have inclusive leadership, then that's going to change the conversation in the search process. Uh, but we also have to figure out ways, how do we cast that net wider? How do we create greater awareness about opportunities? And I know... Um, you know, we've, we're engaging from the National Black Public Relations Society in some, you know, proactive conversations that I'm, I'm looking forward to kind of moving to the next level. And I think, you know, the platform uh, that you, you, you're beginning to develop here, Simon, with communication matches one, one step in our partnership with you is, is, is providing the platform for our members who own companies to get uh, known by companies who are doing search um, and, and, creating a process where all parties involved really take that one extra step potentially to cast a, a broader perspective. I'll just add in, um, uh, and, and actually have you add in a couple of thoughts. So we sort of identify the problem, uh, and we're, we're going to talk more about this, but I'm, I just want to throw in the idea of, of and get your perspective on so what do you think is when it comes to something like word of mouth and, it, and, its, and its role and its importance, and I'm going to actually ask everyone this, what do you see as the solution? What do you see as the, you know, if we recognize that, for example, when it comes to diversity, that finding um, agencies when you, when you go to the people that you know, you may not find the diverse agencies with the capabilities there. And I think, Jennifer, you talked about the idea that people are going companies are actually looking more broadly, are there things that companies should be doing now or thinking about to say, okay, how do we, what do they need to be doing now to actually find the, either diverse firms or the broader range of firms that may be over their immediate horizon? Uh, and maybe we can 
start with you, Jennifer, and go back to Neil, uh, and then we'll we'll bring you involved, uh, Robert, afterwards. Well, I, I want to harken back to a moment of uh, what Neil said is when people come up and say, uh, we, we need, uh, we are looking to be diverse, but there just isn't that deep a pool. And at agencies where I've worked, uh, HR or the CEOs would come up to me and say, Jennifer, we need more of you, like I'm some kind of weird unicorn. <laughs> and, you know, Black PRSA, uh, Asian PRSA, all of them, they were out there all this time, but it never seemed to occur to them to go to these organizations and set up relationships and affiliations so when they are looking to grow out in terms of diversity and hiring the best pool, um, it, it just never really occurred to them to do that. And with the word of mouth, we all tend, and we all, this is across every racial ethnic line, we all, we tend to be uh, stay with each other, and I know that's a broad brush statement, but look at your friends, look at the people you associate with. You all are basically from that same category. So when you're looking at the perspective of word of mouth, uh, you're going to one person who is like you, who may be getting the position that is, you know, reflective of who you are. And while word of mouth, I like word of mouth up to until a point because if it's coming from somebody who I respect and admire, that recommendation absolutely will have a, a higher level of acceptance for, for me. But to go outside of that world and to, to take a risk with someone that you don't know and that you feel that they will be suitable for the position by going to the Black PRSA or any other organization. I think that's important. One thing that I want to make note here is that, uh, and we may be going off topic, and Simon, you can tell me to rein it in for the time being, is that with diversity, we need to make sure that we educate uh, the staff, in, including senior leadership, why diversity is important, and also that, yes, we are looking for a diversified pool, but we're not adding a black person or an Asian person or a transgender person simply to check off a box. We want to have a deeper pool, yes, from which to pull, but we are going to pull the person who is going to be the best qualified for that position. And if that person is transgender, if that person is Hispanic, then that is excellent because when you have a staff that's looking at the people who are coming in, there might be an underground, an under, um, an underforce of resentment thinking that person is coming in simply because they're being checked off the box as opposed to someone who has a deep um, wealth of knowledge that can contribute and add value to the thinking and the work of the team other than the the nature of who that person is. Well, if I may, I also, gonna... um, okay. even though this is, um, you know, word, word of mouth, you know, has always been maybe the least path of, of resistance. Excuse me, I, I get it. Uh, but there are also too many great agencies around that just shouldn't, should simply not be overlooked. And due diligence is really the most important component of any part of an agency search. We need to make sure, you know, because the clients are ultimately uh, going to be investing a lot of money in the agency that they hire. They can't rely solely on on um, word of mouth because it, it clearly um, doesn't present the full picture of what agencies are out there, and you really need to customize every search uh, that you're going to conduct. Yeah, I think yeah. that's a, and a great point, and, and, you know, I think one of the the opportunities uh, is you know, figuring out ways. Uh, you know, Jennifer alluded to partnerships, certainly with groups like MBPRS and others. Uh, and and you, what I would even say is that the, that the advantage of potential partnerships, as you mentioned, Simon, is what what one of the steps is. You know, steps that the agencies and, and we can take is you know how do we create opportunities to create to uh, to uh, create forms for conversation before our search even takes place so that um, you know, there's a comfort and a knowledge and an understanding of what of who's out there um, you know what are the possibilities so that there's a network that is that is consistently being built so 
you know, is that a monthly conversation? Is that a monthly, you know, brown bag uh, lunch with you know, diverse individuals in and around a certain community within the company itself or within the, the, the city itself that opens up that conversation about not just diverse issues but about, you know, the, the, you know what it takes, you know, for certain kinds of campaigns and the, the kind of agencies, ex, you know, expertise is required to, you know, to uh, execute certain tasks that uh, you're looking for in an agency, and I think that's that's where it uh, kind of can help you know, maybe cut the edge uh, in not knowing who's out there, but building that framework of networking and relationship building uh, even before that search begins. And, you know, even before that search begins, Neil, to echo what you just said, <laughs> is that I do a lot of uh, presentations on implicit bias. And implicit mm. bias is basically prejud- prejudices of which we are unaware. And it is so much tied to our core that it happens automatically. You are totally unaware of it. And there is a study. Let's just say you get a resume in the HR director and it's a Jennifer versus a Lawanda. Lawanda may, is considered a black name. It has shown that those who have people who have uh, a name that's considered black, uh, one, they will get a response after 15 resumes are sent out. With the Jennifer, that is considered a white name. And again, this is all based on studies. And the the one with the white sounding name, one resume, you you will get a return on the first ten resumes. So that says that even if, if you have a name that's Lawanda or Kendra, you may not be called back simply because of your name. So looping in with what Neil said is that even before the search begins, there needs to be a full-on education process to remove such things as or lessen the implications of implicit bias and the other factors that may prevent an agency from becoming as fully diverse as possible. No, I think it's, it's, it is a fascinating um, uh, topic when we actually start to look at the question of, you know, what are the conscious decisions that we make and maybe what are the unconscious decisions that we make. And then when actually search is a very conscious process, we really need to uh, get over, and to some extent I think that's part of the process, is identifying through a structured approach, uh, ensuring that we are, overcoming maybe implicit biases and issues. Robert, is that a reasonable way to sort of think about it? And again, if you put yourself in the, in the company's shoes when they're making a decision, you know, is that a reasonable way of framing the process of thinking about this type of a topic that's going to get you the biggest and most qualified pool of candidate firms? Well, you know, the one thing I was thinking about, you know, while I was listening to to everyone speak, is that this is the proverbial, you know, um, word of mouth is 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 looking at um, uh, something that's a mile wide but only an inch deep. I mean, you have to you have to look very closely and really look at do your due diligence when hiring an agency. You really need to consider all the points for the end game, what your goal is. And if diversity is, is, is one of those goals, that has to be taken into, into strong consideration, um, as is the areas of expertise and the experience that a particular firm may have. So I, I do think that, um, you know, it's important. There are so many boxes to check off as you're searching for an agency that um, you really can't leave a stone unturned and just relying on a finite set of uh, individuals that maybe your friends or colleagues is not really going to get you to your end game and why you're, why you're really spending the money, expending the budget for, to hire an agency. I think you really make some good points there because I, I think I'll, I'll flip the script a little bit because you're part of um, – you know, any agency search is finding an agency that has the capacity to perform the task at hand. And, right. you know, uh, you know, as, as I look at the membership of our National Black Public Relations Society, what I know is that we have an extremely experienced uh, membership, you know, many, in many cases, uh, really in the, you know, almost the 40 to 50 year old range 
many of whom who may have worked for an agency uh, at some point, and many of whom now have their own practice, which you know is a one or two person shop, which based on some of these agencies' searches, may not scale uh, you know, at the same level as uh, you know, for the, the, you know, the work required and the expertise required, which is, you know, raises another you know, question of how some of the searches are done. Are there abil- is there ability, I think, we've, you know, of, of through uh, even a more, more expanded RFP process that we can create opportunities uh, that may be at a smaller scale for that small, that uh, that sole proprietorship or one or two person shop to engage at certain parts of a project so that they get a track record uh, and experience and a resume and a portfolio building opportunity so that when the the larger uh, searches are taking place for an agency that at least some of these firms will at least have uh, that that check that box check to say they've handled certain levels of business or certain categories of business, you know whether that's consumer products or technology or or uh, uh, personal care uh, issues, uh, so that that yeah you know, that really uh, puts the ranking of that particular agency diverse or uh, particularly diverse agencies higher in the the score uh, when the final ranking takes place. Well, you know what's also a, point, a good point too, Neil, is I've seen you know. All different size firms partner mm-hmm. with smaller agencies uh, because of their expertise uh, in, in diversity or reaching certain targets, mm-hmm. uh, target audiences. And I think that comes into play here as well. It, it certainly um, benefits uh, maybe the smaller agency, but, but certainly benefits the client overall because that's what they need. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that sometimes gets lost. Uh, yeah, you know, in that, in that, the, in, when we talk about agency search, uh, and sometimes, well, we're looking for an agency that has a certain level of, of income and staff and expertise where, you know, where are those opportunities where through collaboration, um, we can, we can get some of these firms, you know, incorporated in projects on the, you know, on, uh, throughout the course of the year so that when those bigger asks come along, we know that we've got a, a bigger pool of uh, more diverse candidates that potentially could submit their proposals in, in the midst of that search process. No doubt. Now, we, so, so we're going to move to um, maybe um, this will be an interesting question for, for for the panel, which is really and but it's an opportunity to get uh, Tony Tevers involved. Um, you know, one of the issues that, that is an issue actually both for companies and agencies is uh, churn, turnover. Now, I, I don't know what average longevity of relationships is, but clearly part of the goals of agency search and to do it well would be to establish you know, long-term uh, successful relationships. My, my question is, and I'll start with you, Tony, um, you know, is in your sense, based on your experience and, and the research you've done, is there anything we can conclude or, or that you would sort of look at and say, you know, this might actually apply um, to the concept of uh, is agency search potentially one of the contributing factors or limitations of current search practices, a factor that may actually have an impact in terms of the length of and success of agency relationships? Thank you, Simon. Uh, we need to be on slide seven. I'm wondering, do I need to refresh, or is that? Uh, oh, okay? no. I will move to slide seven now. Here we are. All right. So we put out this study uh, a little earlier in the year, back in May, uh, about the satisfaction level of marketing executives with their PR agencies. So you can see a couple of statistics we pulled out there. For context, we were just trying to get an idea of. of what, what the market was saying about PR agencies uh, as a benchmark. We're working on the next iteration now, so I'd welcome comments and suggestions from the audience if they have a chance. This is a 70-page report, so I'm obviously not going to encapsulate it all down into uh, one slide. But uh, the, the survey is also uh, – results are also available as an attachment. I think it's in the materials section. If you click on that tab, you can download the study if, if you'd like to review it in further detail. So. The, the two things that I pull out of the executive summary is only 52% of the study audience would be reluctant to switch to another PR agency. So there, there's 
no no sense that what what uh, what you have is is the best alternative that the grass may be in fact greener uh, on the other side of the fence as it were and the other statistic that I quote is less than half just over forty seven percent of respondents said that they would be likely to purchase additional services from their current PR agency. So there's, again, a gap, something missing in that role, which uh, might be uh, mitigated if, if there was a more comprehensive search process. Now, is, is your, so your, is your sense to some extent, uh, and I'll have Robert actually weigh in afterwards, that, you know, why, why would it be that, um, what are the reasons why companies seem to be, you know, like the agencies they're working with, but really not be that hesitant about moving somewhere else? Well, again, it's, it's a, a, a fairly comprehensive r r report. Um, so I'm, I'm hesitant to draw huge conclusions on, on why, they, why they wouldn't be, uh, why would they be hesitant to leave uh, or change, uh, but it, it does speak to finding the correct match, to finding the correct relationship that you can build on and, and having that good level of communication so that you move forward together on the same lines. Uh, Robert, what's your, your perspective? Well, I mean, you know, first and foremost, switching an agency, you know, is equal to like cost, is costing you more money. Uh, when you've invested the amount of time and energy into finding an agency. Nobody really wants to change an agency, and we actually sometimes counsel our clients to really look look at what they've done and who, who they're working with now to see if a relationship can be repaired. Um, but overall, we, we found that a comprehensive agency search will lead to a longer-term award-winning relationship. Uh, we've personally matched agencies and clients through very, a very thorough process that has gone on um, with some of our clients to receive top KRSA Silver Anvil and other other awards. Uh, churn happens, but no company wants to hire a firm with an above average level of employee turnaround. Uh, therefore, it's critical to research beforehand if this is a problem at a particular agency. So ways to safeguard that I would suggest is that uh, is making sure that, that the team that presents is the team that will work on your account and um, make sure you build in specifically requirements and ask how long each member has been with the firm. Client references are also the best way to learn about staff retention, and most agencies do not expect you to ask that question when you're checking their references. So it's a very easy way to sort of uh, determine that. And if a company takes the time and, more importantly, the effort to implement a fair, balanced, and objective and open RFP process, not only will the best agency win, the agency best suited to the client's business and business problems will win. So there, there you will more than likely be able to be working with an agency that also has a good staff retention uh, because they, they know how to operate and, and do their business well. Uh, terrific. You know, I have to say intuitively as, a, as an entrepreneur, um, and, and given my past experience, you know, that idea of if you've only sort of looked to your immediate horizon or the horizon of your peers in terms of the firms that are out there, you've always kind of got one eye open for, well, is there someone better out there? Um, you know, is there another opportunity that I might have actually missed? And, and I wonder, and I'll, I'll come back to you, Jennifer, and, and, and maybe Neil, if you can kind of give a quick sense of, has, has that been your experience? Has your experience actually been if, if you were part of a comprehensive search or a very thorough search that the relationship tended to um, be, be more productive um, rather than, you know, maybe it was kind of a, uh, just, just some other version of it? What are your thoughts? Well, no one is irreplaceable, but the thing about it is we have to make sure that we try to be as non-replaceable as possible. And as I say to my clients and to my prospects, I do not consider myself your vendor. I am your partner, and I am a partner to your success because your success is my success. 
and moving forward from that, you need to really become a, a true partner and to constantly be creative and innovative and be able to stand up to them when you feel that they are going left, when they should be going right. And the thing about our field, that it's changing rapidly. I mean, public relations has changed so much over the past five years. It's hard for even we pros to keep on top of it, but that's why we're hired. So with uh, the new technology out there, you know, by suggesting to one client that they do a podcast and they're now doing it and they're getting uh, – uh, acknowledgement for it. So look at new communication channels such as Twitter chats and showing that, you know, yes, you are a partner. Yes, um, you are out there doing the traditional PR, but you're also bringing something um, of additional value that will assist them in forwarding their own goals as well. So, you know, and as for um, retention, I think that that's very important because there there has been churn in our agency and uh, with um, with uh, employees who develop a strong relationship with the client and then they leave, uh, that client notices it. So I think for us who own our businesses, we always do these customer satisfaction studies. I think that we should also turn inward and go back to our staff and do blind studies and or surveys and say, you know, what makes you what's making you happy, what's you know, what's good, what's bad, so that you can be able to identify problems before they become issues and the staff members realize they're part of the process and feel insisted because their voices are being heard and listened to. Yeah, I'm, Neil, I'm going to come back to you, but I'm conscious of we've probably got 10 more minutes to quickly go through um, some of the additional questions I want to get through so we can leave some time for Q&A at the end. Mm-hmm. Um, so actually what I'd like to do is to move now a little bit to, the, you know, the question of what does a robust process actually look like? And, and Robert, maybe you can um, provide some uh, perspective around what you found to be keys to search success. And let's put this in the context of, you know, what are the takeaways from a company as they're listening to the to this webinar? What are the specific things that will help them achieve a better search result? Well, I think the theme of this conversation is really sort of, you know, really – that you just can't rely on, on, on one quick method to hire an agency. Uh, you really have to have a process and you have to really, um, really create a timeline and, 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 and an entire process before you begin searching for a firm. I always recommend that internal organization is probably the top bit of advice for any client. The best searches are begin, are began by looking internally. And I'm, by, by saying that, I mean how prepared is the company to work with an agency to ensure mutual success? Uh, for example, you have to consider how your own time will have to be allotted to give the agency the attention it needs. You, you have to brief and prepare your own internal teams and departments how they'll be interacting with an agency. Then you have to carefully contemplate what your goals for hiring the agency are and the specific scope of work you will ask them to accomplish. And after you understand this, you then need to focus on the budget and how much you have to spend. We consider this an essential part of any RFP and would not issue any RFP without providing at least some type of budget parameters. Quite frankly, you have to let the agency know what you want to spend so they can allocate the resources to service your account and achieve your goals. I could go on, but I think I've covered what I think is sort of the critical 10,000-foot view of really what you need to do, uh, the, the, the bare elements to get that search uh, in place. Well, I know I just forwarded the slide, and, and one of the things that you actually also talked about is the importance of a focused approach to shortlisting firms using RFQs and RFPs, and one of the things I think that's been interesting is I've spoken to people in advance of this, and, and as we look at actually building um, an RFP tool on communications matches, 
most agencies hate RFPs. Um, so, you know, because they've probably had bad experiences, you know, they don't feel it's necessarily producing the right results. But ultimately for companies, it's important to have a discipline process. Can you provide just a, in a you know, couple of minutes just a quick sense of why RFQs and why RFPs are so important and, and why they, they need to be very, very focused to get the best results? Well, our searches always begin with an RFQ because if you complete the process that I described earlier by really looking internally, you will know exactly the type of agency you want to hire. Maybe you have a, a long list that comes from word of mouth and from other resources, but you need to whittle down that list based on what the agencies truly can pr provide you. If you begin a search with a request for qualifications, then you can determine what real background and experience an agency has. You may have X, uh, your company may do X, but it may ratchet down to Y and Z, which is what the agency needs to accomplish. And the agency may not necessarily have those skill sets or the agencies that you're looking at. So you really need to find out um, what they've done in the past. You need to know if they have any conflicts of interest. You need to understand how large the firm may be, if you need size, if you need a certain geographical um, or, or, or locations or reaching certain uh, targets in certain uh, cities and countries. You need to make sure you know all of that, and you can determine that very quickly with an RFQ. I just mentioned the conflicts of interest. You need to know what other similar clients agencies have worked with that will either uh, be directly pose a conflict for you or may open up a door that that will work for your for your uh, specific RFP. So you, you really need to sort of get all those ducks in a row before you can move on to the RFP stage, um, disseminate that, and then have the agencies intelligently respond to what exactly the requirements are that you've provided. Uh, Tony, can I, um, uh, you know, prevail on you just to provide a little bit of perspective? I know you actually, um, you know, based upon your research in terms of um, satisfaction, based upon your maybe your own perspective, is there anything that you'd kind of add to, you know, why it's so important to kind of get these the um, uh, the interests aligned and to get to the right firm for the right company? So the, the perspective we take from uh, is that we sit in between the agency and the client often or in between the PR department and the internal client, sometimes both. And it, it, we'll see when the communications internally or between the client are failing, and that's an indication that uh, the, the homework hasn't been done, that the uh, depth of search or, or breadth of search hasn't been accomplished because we don't see – people striving for the same goals. There's no brief that everybody's working towards in terms of objectives, decisions to be made, expectations. And uh, that's where we, we see the breakdown and uh, we, we see that there's a need for a, a better search tool, better search criteria so that the matchup uh, is better and the communication flows and the work is actually accomplished well. Perfect. Um, so I'm now going to uh, focus on dig down a little bit further, and we'll, we'll do this relatively um, quickly. I don't want to do this, give it short shrift, but one of the interesting questions that um, you know, when we were choosing actually for communications match, sort of the image of that, that we use, um, you know, I got some interesting feedback was um, that the image looked like the United Nations and people were not old or serious enough looking, um, which wasn't a compliment. Uh, another comment I got was... Um, you know, when companies need diverse agencies, uh, the, the companies need diverse agencies only when they're working for projects to reach diverse audiences, um, which is, a um, again, a sort of an interesting perspective. Neil, from your standpoint, um, and, and then if uh, Jennifer, depending on how your voice is holding up, can you just, just outline in a few sentences, remind people why it's so important to have uh, diverse agencies as part of the selection process uh, and, and, and why companies should obviously, they are thinking about it, but why it needs to be a priority. Well, the, look, the demographics of this uh, country and the, and the world speak for themselves. We're increasingly um, uh, 
becoming a more diverse community and consumer market uh, across the board. Um, and we know the numbers in, as we look to 2040 and 2050 speak for themselves in terms of the the, the number of of, uh, of Hispanics, uh, Asians, and African Americans who will become in, increasingly parts of the majority populations in cities, uh, small and large. Uh, without diverse voices at the table and in the room, it's hard to have a good conversation that will address some of the sensitivities about uh, the various markets and opportunities that are out there uh, and how best you reach those markets and those, those, those segments. Um, not to say that a non-diverse audience can't, but I can tell you the conversation is always different when I'm in the room and it's uh, – and quite often and unfortunately too often that that tends to be I'm the only person in the room kind of sharing that perspective and it always opens the door to new possibilities. Uh, why leave money on the table when you could have a, a conversation that potentially looks at how we better position messaging, messaging or products to an audience that's very consumer driven. That's why diversity matters not only at the C-suite level, in the mid-career level and entry uh, level to kind of open those conversations uh, and opportunities for for a new business. Jennifer, how how would you respond to to that second bit of feedback that I had? Is you know when someone's looking for a diverse agency, that you know they only want to find a diverse agency because they're working on a project to reach you know a particular um, let's say multicultural segment, and that's the only time to reach out to to a, a, a diverse agency. Well, you know, let me be blunt. That's stupid. Um, the United States is a multicultural nation, and as Neil was saying, the you know, blacks, Hispanics, we are becoming a majority minority nation, and that's the way it is around the the world. And if you are going to negate the majority, then um, you are not going to be successful, whether in terms of getting clients, getting accounts, and even how you are perceived, and that will be reflected in your work. And Simon, you and I had a discussion earlier about uh, the mistake that was made by Pepsi when they used Kendall Jenner in that advertising campaign that uh, pulled from the Black Lives Matter march and the vociferous backlash that it got to the point where Pepsi had to immediately pull the commercial that it spent millions of dollars for and had to issue an apology. And it was a self-created crisis for them. And as Neil was saying earlier, when he's in the room, the conversation changes. And you need to have diverse voices in a room where such sensitivities are immediately identified and for someone to say, you can't do this and this is why. So you, you need to, if you, if, if you don't have a diverse agency, then you're going to go the way of the, the dinosaur and that's the way, that's the way I see it. And there's no excuse not to have an agency that is reflective of the world that we live in. So we're going to switch gears for a moment, and we, we'll take a, just a couple of minutes to respond to this question and then see if there are any uh, questions that we have um, from the audience. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time obviously focused on diversity. We have spent time focused on uh, the process that is required to uh, effectively find both diverse and digital agencies. But if we can talk for a moment about um, finding digital agencies, in other words, you know, today many PR agencies have all the digital skill sets, but there are also a, a many, many very specialized niche uh, agencies focused on specific um, uh, aspects of digital communications. You know, is there anything different or, or anything that we need to think a little bit about or the audience should think about um, when it comes to finding digital agencies? Or, or do you think actually to some extent the issues that we've been talking about uh, with a heavier weight on, on diversity, uh, are they similar issues as, as it relates to finding digital firms? Uh, and maybe, Tony, we'll start with you, just if, if you've got any particular perspective to share, and then, uh, then, then Robert, maybe you can chime in. So 
one of the things that we point out in, in the in the research is the weaknesses in what marks the decision makers consider high important areas uh, in their PR agencies include social media mo monitoring, influencer marketing, stakeholder research, developing PR campaigns and case studies, and building PR surveys together. So I think it's very similar to the diversity uh, model is that first you have to recognize that how you're perceived by your client is very different than how you perceive yourself uh, and be open to the fact that there could be gaps and, and biases that you're bringing to the, to the table. Uh, Robert, and w w what's your view? Well, it's very, it's, it's very interesting in the case of digital shops. I mean, I've seen some very strong digital PR agencies, but I've also seen a number of them that sort of had to play catch up with their PR disciplines and sort of realized that they were missing the components of integrated communications and, and really properly putting together uh, a communications plan. It was one thing to do something online, but it was another thing to sort of connect the dots and really sort of overall move the, um, uh, you know, move the bar for clients. So uh, I say, like any other skill, an agency has to have demonstrable experience and good case studies and, and client references to support what they can do in the digital world. Um, you need to sort of, once again, put this through as part of your due diligence. Uh, and you also have to recognize what your long-term goal is. Um, don't just say you need to create a, uh, a social media program without considering what other uh, components of your organization you need to cover from a communications perspective. I'm talking to a prospective client right now that said to me as an afterthought that we do digital work also, and maybe we need to just throw that in um, to to what we're looking for with an agency. Um, it's actually a good thing because I'd rather think holistically for a client as opposed to just think piecemeal and then make a mistake uh, by going the, in the wrong direction looking for a, an agency. Well, let me invite, um, uh, for, for if anyone would like to uh, ask a question, um, it's a good time to ask it. We are um, in our last uh, few minutes of, of the webinar. So um, if you have a question, please ask it, um, and uh, we'll be uh, following those. I'm actually then, to, while waiting for any questions to be posed, um, I, what I'd like to do also then is, is um, just to have the team share um, your final perspective um, on are there any are there any specific points um, that um, I'm just <laughs> jumping over this last slide are there any specific takeaways again one or two things that you think are really important um, for from a company's perspective maybe from an agency's perspective to take away from this conversation and we can start maybe with you Neil Sure. Um, the uh, to to be part of the process is to have access to the process. Um, we've got to be part of the conversation. So uh, I think strongly identifying opportunities to partner with local or national organizations that happen to have a diverse uh, membership is one way to start the conversation. Um, opening the door uh, and spreading the word on the search process so that more agencies, particularly those of diverse uh, backgrounds, get a chance to be a part of the conversation. You know, uh, the thing that was running in the back of my mind during this conversation is there are probably dozens of agency searches going on right now that that uh, my firm uh, has no idea is taking place because I probably don't scale or fit some criteria based on some of those boxes. So how to I position a firm like mine or potentially others in my my footsteps of, of beginning to get that expertise, scale that level of business that suddenly gets on the radar of research or becomes uh, part of that RFQ process. And that's where the relationship uh, building can really help in terms of expanding that net. Um, let me move to you, um, uh, Tony. Any kind of takeaways? I go back to um, listening to Jennifer and, and, and some of the other speakers. I, I think the key is just to recognize what uh, biases and influences you're bringing 
to the search process. And once you recognize those and bring them out, you'll maybe get a, a more transparent search, which would be a valuable thing. Uh, Jennifer. I would say that um, it's – and the reason why I'm pausing here is that for so many years I've uh, heard this, you know, type of conversation from agencies that we want to be diverse, and it came from a place of good meaning. But as this conversation that we've had on this webinar, it takes time, energy, effort, and money, and you need to walk the talk. And this conversation will be successful if we get a few um, agencies out there to really sit down and, and pull together a plan and uh, to really walk the talk in terms of enriching their staff by bringing in people of different backgrounds and cultures and showcasing in an authentic way that they represent uh, society and all the different uh, thoughts and issues in a, in a manner that will behoove the, the clients that they represent. Thanks. You know, Robert, I'm going to actually ask a, a question that really has kind of um, been asked that, that, that's probably perfect for you, um, which is in the search process, and maybe you can incorporate this into your kind of closing uh, comments, is there a num an ideal number of agencies to to be considered at the RFQ or the RFP uh, stages? You know, are there uh, maybe that and uh, are there other specific thoughts that you have, again, that would be just cardinal, almost rules, but there are, of course, no such thing as specific rules, but are there very specific things like that that, that someone who's on listening to this webinar should be going, okay, uh, that's how I should be thinking about this? I don't think there's a there's a, a one rigid way um, or or method to successfully find a firm. I think it's more important for you to know what your end game is and what your goals are, what you need, uh, and to sort of just make a blanket term uh, to, to 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 go in one direction or the other. I think uh, you're not doing yourself the, the the service that you need. But having said that. I think you really have to um, ask yourself, um, you know, or be open to to different types of agencies, um, different um, um, structures that agencies have, something that could be non-traditional. And that could be diversity or it could not be diversity. We have identified agencies that are virtual agencies for clients that never would have considered hiring a virtual agency, and sure enough, it's worked out very well and actually gone on also to win an award. I think it's really a matter of being able to um, sort of knowing, you know, starting with what you need, what your end game has to be, and then doing your homework and finding the right agencies that are out there to participate and become a candidate for your search. So. You know, to wrap it all, to wrap it up, to actually answer your question, your original question, potentially you want to start with a, a much larger handful, hand, uh, handful of agencies uh, to start your search, to do the RFQ process. Then you want to whittle it down to about a third of those agencies. So perhaps you really want to only end up um, looking at between seven and maybe nine agencies at most. And you want to be very selective, as, I, as I've mentioned. Uh, but looking internally, including your budget, uh, creating a search criteria and an internal team, um, producing a comprehensive RF, uh, RFP, and not only being transparent, but also um, being forthcoming to every agency that's competing for your, uh, for your proposal. And you're not necessarily looking to... Um, um, a favor uh, someone. I don't want any uh, any uh, um, any, any thoughts about wiring uh, one agency to win. That's that's never the case uh, in any of the searches that we do. We haven't touched on that, but that's that's a cardinal sin which occurs. I know, unfortunately, in our industry. So you have to set those rules, narrow it down to finalists, structure presentations, and eventually, I always say the cream rises up to the top. You will get the best agency that you need, and it will be a long term relationship provided you put your homework and time into it. 
Uh, that's much appreciated. Actually, one of the other questions that was asked uh, um, is the question actually of, of fit, um, you know, how you actually, because we've got all these dimensions that may be relatively easy to do, but there's also a personality component that goes along with, with finding firms. And I think um, that, I assume, is really kind of down to um, uh, chemistry and uh, I tell you what, I'm going to give Neil the last word. Uh, how important to, do you think, Neil, as, as someone who uh, has looked at this from different sides, how, how important is fit? Oh, great question. Yeah, I think part of that, you know, access, transparency, um, you know, making sure the the process is broad goes to certainly comfort level with the the, uh, the agency you're going to work with, so that there's a proper fit, and you know that that goes to uh, the, the fundamental issue is that uh, and, until we kind of get a broader sense of more diverse firms, you know, actively bidding on some of these uh, these projects uh, and potentially included or being asked to bid on these projects, then we'll, we'll still have this kind of discomfort uh, because of, of lack of, of friendships, lack of relationships. So I go back to build those relationships, find ways to have conversations with folks that you may not typically have on a daily basis or a weekly basis or on a monthly basis, expand the network, and once you expand that network, you're going to find new opportunities with new agencies, uh, many of whom uh, have powerful op you know, skill sets to offer uh, for any uh, agency and as they do their search. Well, highly appreciated. I, I just want to thank um, the entire panel for uh, taking the time to speak with everyone um, and share their perspective. Um, the, uh, this webinar will be available as a replay. Um, and thanks, everyone, indeed, and we shall now uh, close. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Simon, thank you, um, Compro. Thanks to my fellow panelists. Thank you. This does conclude today's conference. We thank you for your participation. You may disconnect your lines at this time and have a wonderful day.